Good evening, everybody. My name is Steve Grumbine. I am the founder of Real Progressives. Since the beginning of Bernie Sanders' campaign, Real Progressives uh, came into existence. We supported Bernie Sanders from the very first day of his campaign. Um, and even before he had run, we knew it was coming. We were, we had heard, it was rumored that he was going to run. Uh, we knew that uh, Dr. Stephanie Calton was going to support Bernie. And we went ahead and decided that we were going to st start a page and a group called Real Progressives as a counter to the term Real Democrats, because we weren't necessarily Democrats. We were all Real Progressives. And this picture right here is the very first Real Progressives logo <laughs> that we had. We didn't know we were going to become anything more than what we became or what we are today. We just thought we were a bunch of people going out there doing live streams and things like that. We had no idea that it would grow and grow and grow. But it started off, it was all about Bernie Sanders. And I'm going to play a clip from something that I feel is extremely important that will remind you guys of a time, I think, um, that ultimately, uh, you know, was quite frankly a magical period in all of our existence. Um, and that period was back when Bernie spoke at Liberty University. And the reason why I'm going to show you this, it's got nothing to do with Bernie Sanders, ironically. It has everything to do with what we all stand for. It doesn't matter where he is today, but I want you to remember what it was like at that moment when Bernie Sanders was in fact Bernie Sanders, the Bernie Sanders that you know and love, the one that made all of us become, you know, burners. So I'm going to put this up here and you guys see if you remember this. By acknowledging what I think uh, all of you already know, and that is the views that many here at Liberty University have and I on a number of important issues are very, very different. I believe in women's rights. And the right of a woman to control. Too often in our country, and I think both sides bear responsibility for us, there is too much shouting at each other. There is too much making fun of each other. Now, in my view, and I say this as somebody whose voice is hoarse because I have given dozens of speeches, in the last few months, it is easy to go out and talk to people who agree with you. I was in Greensboro, North Carolina just last night. All right. We have 9,000 people out. Mostly they agreed with me. And tonight, we're going to be in Manassas and have thousands out and they agree with me. That's not hard to do. And that's what politicians by and large do. We go out and we talk to people who agree with us. But it is harder, but not less important for us to try and communicate with those who do not agree with us on every issue. And it is important to see where, if possible, and I do believe it's possible, 
we can find common grounds. Now, Liberty University is a religious school, obviously. And all of you are proud of that. You are a school which, as all of us in our own way, tries to understand the meaning of morality. What does it mean to live a moral life? And you try to understand in this very complicated modern world that we live in, what the words of the Bible mean in today's society. You are a school which tries to teach its students how to behave with decency and with honesty and how you can best relate to your fellow human beings. And I applaud you for trying to achieve those goals. Let me take a moment or a few moments to tell you what motivates me in the work that I do as a public servant, as a senator from the state of Vermont. And let me tell you that it goes without saying, I am far, far from being a perfect human being, but I am motivated by a vision which exists in all of the great religions, in Christianity, in Judaism, in Islam, in Buddhism, and other religions. And that vision is so beautifully and clearly stated in Matthew 7.12. And it states, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. I am the founder. That is the golden rule. Do unto others what you would have them do to you. That is the golden rule, and it is not very complicated. Let me be frank, as I said a moment ago. I understand that the issues of abortion and gay marriage are issues that you feel very strongly about. We disagree on those issues. I get that. But let me respectfully suggest that there are other issues out there that are of enormous consequence to our country and in fact to the entire world that maybe, just maybe, we do not disagree on and maybe just maybe we can try to work together to resolve them <laughs> amos 524 but let justice roll on like a river righteousness like a never failing stream justice treating others the way we want to be treated treating all people no matter their race their color their stature in life with respect and with dignity Now here is my point. Some of you may agree with me and some of you may not. But in my view, it would be hard for anyone in this room today to make the case that the United States of America, our great country, a country which all of us love, it would be hard to make the case that we are a just society 
or anything resembling a just society today. In the United States of America today, there is massive injustice in terms of income and wealth inequality. Injustice is rampant. We live, and I hope all of you know this, in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. But most Americans don't know that because almost all of that wealth and income is going to the top 1%. Now that's the truth. We are living at a time, and I want all of you, if you would, put this in the context of the Bible, not me, in the context of the Bible. We are living at a time where a handful of people have wealth beyond comprehension. And I'm talking about tens of billions of dollars, enough to support their families for thousands of years with huge yachts and jet planes and tens of billions. More money than they would ever know what to do with. But at that very same moment, there are millions of people in our country, let alone the rest of the world, who are struggling to feed their families. They are struggling to put a roof over their heads, and some of them are sleeping out on the streets. They are struggling to find money in order to go to a doctor when they are sick. Now, when we talk about morality, and when we talk about justice, we have to, in my view, understand that there is no justice when so few have so much and so many have so little. There is no justice, and I want you to hear this clearly, when the top one-tenth of one percent, not one percent, the top one-tenth of one percent, today in America owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. And in your hearts, you will have to determine the morality of that and the justice of that. In my view, there is no justice when here in Virginia and Vermont and all over this country, millions of people are working long hours for abysmally low wages of $7.25 an hour, of $8 an hour, of $9 an hour working hard, but unable to bring in enough money to adequately feed their kids. And yet at that same time, 58% of all new income generated is going to the top 1%. You have got to think about the morality of that, the justice of that, and whether or not that is what we want to see in our country. In my view, there is no justice when, in recent years, we have seen a proliferation of millionaires and billionaires, while at the same time, the United States of America has the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country on earth? How can we, I want you to go into your hearts, how can we talk about morality 
about justice when we turn our backs on the children of our country. Now you've got to think about it. You have to think about it and you have to feel it in your guts. Are you content? Do you think it's moral that 20% of the children in this country, the wealthiest country in the history of the world, are living in poverty? Do you think it is acceptable that 40% of African American children are living in poverty? In my view, there is no justice and morality suffers when in our wealthy country, millions of children go to bed hungry. That is not morality. And that in my view is not what America should be about. In my view, there is no justice when the 15, 15 wealthiest people in this country in the last two years, two years, saw their wealth increase by $170 billion. Two years. Wealthiest 15 people in this country saw their wealth increase by $170 billion. My friends, that is more wealth acquired in a two year period than is owned by the bottom 130 million Americans. And while the very, very rich become much richer, millions of families have no savings at all, nothing in the bank. And they worry every single day that if their car breaks down, they can't get to work. And if they can't get to work, they lose their jobs. And if they lose their jobs, they don't feed their families. In the last two years, 15 people saw a $170 billion increase in their wealth. 45 million Americans live in poverty. That, in my view, is not justice. That is a rigged economy designed by the wealthiest people in this country to benefit the wealthiest people in this country at the expense of everybody else. In my view, there is no justice when thousands of Americans die every single year because they don't have any health insurance and don't go to a doctor when they should. I have talked personally to doctors throughout Vermont and physicians all over this country. And without exception, they tell me that there are times when patients walk into their office very, very sick. And they say, why didn't you come in here when you were sick? And the answer is, I don't have any health insurance or I have a high deductible. I thought the problem would get better. And sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes they die because they lack health insurance. That is not justice. That is not morality. People should not be dying in the United States of America when they are sick. What that is, is an indication that we are the only major country on earth 
that does not guarantee health care to all people as a right. And I think we should change that. And I think, I think that when we talk about morality, what we are talking about is all of God's children, the poor, the wretched, they have a right to go to a doctor when they are sick. You know, there is a lot of talk in this country from politicians about family values. You've all heard that. Well, let me tell you about a family value. In my view, there is no justice when low income and working class mothers are forced to separate from their babies one or two weeks after birth and go back to work because they need the money that their jobs provide. Now, I know everybody here, we all are, maybe in different ways, but all of us believe in family values. Jane and I have four kids. We have seven beautiful grandchildren. We believe in family values. But it is not a family value when all of you know that the most important moments and time of a human being's life is the first weeks and months after that baby is born. That is the moment when mother bonds with the baby, gets to love and know her baby, and dad is there as well. That is what a family is about. And those of you, or at least those of you who are parents, more parents back here than there, I suspect, you know what an unforgettable moment that is, what an important moment that is. And I want you to think whether you believe it is a family value that the United States of America is the only, only major country on earth that does not provide paid family and medical leave. Now, in English, what that means is that all over the world, when a woman has her baby, she is guaranteed the right. Because society understands how important that moment is. She is guaranteed the right to stay home and get income in order to nurture her baby. And that is why I believe when we talk about family values, that the United States government must provide at least 12 weeks of paid family and medical leave. In my view, there is no justice in our country when youth unemployment exists at tragic tragically high levels. I requested a study last month from a group of economists, and what they told me is that 51% of African American high school graduates between the ages of 17 and 20 are unemployed or underemployed, 51%. We have in this country sufficient amounts of money to put more people in jail than any other country on earth. The United States has more people in jail than China, a communist authoritarian country. But apparently we do not have enough money to provide jobs and education to our young people. I believe that's wrong. I am not a theologian. 
I am not an expert on the Bible, nor am I a Catholic. I am just a United States Senator from the small state of Vermont. But I agree with Pope Francis, who will soon be coming to visit us in the United States. I agree with Pope Francis when he says, and I quote, the current financial crisis originated in a profound human crisis. The denial of the primacy of the human person. And this is what he writes. We have created new idols. The worship of the ancient golden calf has returned in a new and ruthless guise in the idolatry of money and the dictatorship and the dictatorship of an impersonal economy lacking a truly human purpose. End of quote. And the Pope also writes, quote, there is a need for financial reform along ethical lines that would produce in its turn an economic reform to benefit everyone. Money has to serve, not to rule. End of quote. Now those are pretty profound words, which I hope we will all think about. In the Pope's view, and I agree with him, we are living in a nation and in a world, and the Bible speaks to this issue, in a nation and in a world which worships not love of brothers and sisters, not love of the poor and the sick, but worships the acquisition of money and great wealth. I do not believe that is the country we should be living in. Money and wealth should serve the people. The people should not have to serve money and wealth. Throughout human history, there has been endless discussion. It is part of who we are as human beings, people who think and ask questions. Endless discussion and debate about the meaning of justice and about the meaning of morality. And I know that here at Liberty University, those are the kinds of discussions you have every day, and those are the kinds of discussions you should be having, and the kind of discussions we should be having all over America. I would hope, and I conclude with this thought, I would hope very much that as part of that discussion and part of that learning process, some of you will conclude that if we are honest in striving to be a moral and just society, it is imperative that we have the courage to stand with the poor, to stand with working people, and when necessary, take on very powerful and wealthy people whose greed, in my view, is doing this country enormous harm. Thank you all very much. So that right there, my friends, was a very, very powerful video. And I showed this to you tonight to remember, not to celebrate Bernie. If you celebrate Bernie, that's fine. 
If you don't like Bernie, that's fine. I'm not here to tell you how to feel. I am here to try to remind you this movement came as a direct result of all of us coming together and believing. I'm sorry for some of you who believed in one man, but for many of us, we believed in this movement. We believed in the 99%. As you know, Real Progressives supports his entire economic team, Stephanie Kelton and gang. They are the reason we came to meet with Bernie. They're the reason that we joined this fight because progressives have forever not been able to answer the question, how are you going to pay for it? We have so much in front of us, folks. Do not let Donald Trump get you down. Do not let the current state of the Democratic Party get you down. Do not let the lack of a progressive party right now that is viable to get you down. There are movements outside the duopoly, but don't even worry about that. Remember this right now for this moment. We as a people, we as the 99%, if we remember that moment, if we remember how we felt, if we remember it was always about us, that is how we get it back. And if we stop allowing people to drag us around by the nose, talking about the Russians, if we allow people to keep dragging us through the mud, talking about Cheeto Lini, we are never going to recapture that feeling of unitedness, that feeling of oneness, that feeling of purpose that drove us to work round the clock in hope of a better future for our children and for our own lives. That right there is my favorite Bernie Sanders speech. Obviously, I thought about putting the Sacramento one up just because of the sheer crowd. I thought about doing Georgetown University when he did the Democratic Socialism speech. I thought about doing the one where the bird landed on the podium. But this one always stuck out to me because this is the one where he talked to the enemy, the enemy. He talked to these religious conservatives and he spoke their language while saying his message. Now, I don't really give two shits what people think about Bernie right now. That's not the point of this. The point is we believed and we believed in the message, not just the messenger, the message still remains. The platform still remains. $33 trillion in new spending over 10 years. Infrastructure, healthcare, college. The list is long. It's all there for our taking. There's no reason that even without the parties listening to us, that we, not me, us, we, the 99%, can unite with or without these parties and make it so absolutely untenable for them, make it miserable for them, make it absolutely impossible to ignore us. If we remember the platform, forget your feelings about one person or another. And let's stay on point. Let's stay on message. I'm Steve Grumbine with Real Progressives. I really, really hope you enjoyed this encore presentation of Bernie Sanders at Liberty University. For me, it was about reconnecting with the movement. Have a good night, everybody.